gentlemen, please welcome the leader of the Scottish National Party, First Minister of Scotland, Alex Salmond. Well, delegates, uh, this is uh, where I get my uh, opportunity to introduce the Deputy First Minister, the Deputy Leader of the Scottish National Party, Nicola Sturgeon, or I get my opportunity for revenge <laughs> for Nicola's introduction of me yesterday. <laughs> Mind you, I, I should be careful, very careful, I've been told, as to what I say. Uh, some of you might be aware that Nicola has become a huge fan of a certain Scandinavian political drama. She's a, a keen follower of Borgen, which is the Danish series, which deals with the intrigue and plotting at the very heart of, of Danish politics. Now, I don't know how many of you have followed this program, but suffice it to say, it concerns a, a canny young female politician who runs rings round her male counterparts in the opposition and in her own party and ends up as Prime Minister. <laughs> now, you think there might be a message for me in all of that? <laughs> you know, Borgen, resistance is futile. <laughs> the delegates, uh, when Nicola welcomed you to conference yesterday. She, she of course, mentioned the, the huge progress uh, which has been made by the Scottish National Party in this great city of, of Glasgow. One thing she, she didn't draw attention to, but I'm going to draw attention to it now, uh, is Nicola, of course, uh, when she won government in 2007, was the first ever SNP victory at a general election uh, in this city of, of Glasgow. First time we'd won a seat in a national a, a election at parliamentary level. What she also didn't mention was that, you know, it's one thing to, to win a seat, but to hold a seat is the real test of uh, political calibre. And when Nicola went into last year's election in Glasgow Southside, she not only had to hold the governed seat, but the enlargement of the constituency meant that notionally she was fighting a seat with a Labour majority because of the expansion of the boundaries. Well, not only did Nicola Sturgeon hold that seat, win that seat. She won it with a, a 4,349 majority and a whopping 54.4% of the vote. <laughs> so it shows, fellow delegates, that Nicola Sturgeon is not just held in the highest regard by this party, by this conference, but even more importantly by the, the people of Glasgow. The election victories that we've enjoyed and the progress in this city has been down to the work of the activists and the branch members, the message, the policies of the SNP government, but they've also been down to the work and commitment of Nicola Sturgeon. It's my enormous pleasure, delegates, to ask you to give the, the warmest welcome to the Deputy First Minister of Scotland, the Deputy Leader of the Scottish National Party, the MSP for Glasgow Southside, Nicola Sturgeon. Delegates, what the First Minister himself didn't draw attention to was that the fiction of Borgen actually came true in Denmark when they elected their first woman Prime Minister last year. Now, just to be clear, just to be clear, I am not suggesting that anything like that will happen here anytime soon. I just thought I'd point it out. Delegates, I have to start today with a confession. So, okay, Peter, don't look so worried. <laughs> the thing is, at our spring conference this time last year, I misled you. And it's been weighing really, really heavily on my conscience ever since. 
So this is my chance today to set the record straight. I stood at this very podium a year ago and I confidently predicted that we would win two first-past-the-post victories in Glasgow. I got it wrong. We didn't win two seats. Delegates, we won five first-past-the-post seats in the city of Glasgow. Delegates, that was a stunning result. It was down to the hard work and dedication of many of you here today, and I thank you for it. Now, you might have noticed that the fortunes of Labour in Glasgow have changed in the last year as well. At this time last year, they had a comfortable majority in the city chambers. Today, the administration is on a knife edge. And you know the really remarkable thing is this. This dramatic collapse has happened without an election, without a single public vote being cast. That really does take a special kind of incompetence. <laughs> I think Labour is hoping that the damage they've done to themselves is as bad as it gets. But I have a feeling they ain't seen nothing yet. Delegates, just wait till the Glasgow voters get their hands on them. <laughs> now, Glasgow Labour might be shrinking before our very eyes, but our council group has welcomed two new members over the past few months. First, Ken Andrew won the Hillhead by-election, and then Councillor Irfan Rabani left Labour and joined the SNP. Irfan wants to campaign for a better Glasgow and an independent Scotland. I think he's come to the right place, so let us give him a warm SNP welcome. Delegates, I love this city. It deserves the best, and our government is investing in Glasgow's future. We've made a massive commitment to this city in our spending plans. I can tell you today that in this and the next three years, we will invest more than £3,000 million on infrastructure in Glasgow. £3,000 million. Delegates, that is commitment. It's investment in hospitals and health centres, schools and colleges, public transport and housing. And of course, we are fully supporting the Commonwealth Games in 2014. Oh yes, delegates, we intend 2014 to be a very, very special year indeed. Our government is backing Glasgow with hard cash and we need partners in the city chambers who will work with us and put this city first. Labour does not fit that bill. Labour cares more about its own desperate fight for survival than it does about the interests of Glasgow. Its authority is slipping away and not just in numbers. Delegates, a party that resorts to bullying has lost its moral authority as well. <laughs> this city needs a change of leadership. Now, we take nothing for granted. Just as we did last year, we will work tirelessly for every single vote. But be in no doubt, we are working to remove the dead hand of Labour control from this great city. It is time to let Glasgow flourish. <laughs> Friends, we will be campaigning to win the local elections everywhere in Scotland. We have a record number of candidates standing in every single council area in the country. From Stranraer 
to Shetland and all points in between, we truly are Scotland's party. <clears throat> Delegates, improving the health of people in Scotland, as you know, is a driving priority for our government. Last year, I announced the Detect Cancer Early initiative. It's an ambitious plan focused on the three big killer cancers, breast, bowel and lung. It aims to save 300 lives a year. Now, when we started that programme, we knew that tackling lung cancer would be particularly difficult. Scotland has one of the highest rates of lung cancer in the world, with nearly 5,000 people diagnosed each year, double the rate for the UK as a whole. And it's the most disadvantaged in Scotland who are at the greatest risk. If it's diagnosed early, you have a 60% chance of survival. But if the cancer is well advanced, the survival rate drops to just 1%. Early detection is paramount. And that's why I am delighted to announce today that the Scottish Government is backing a new groundbreaking diagnostic test to detect lung cancer earlier. The test detects what are called autoantibodies in the blood. If the trial of this test works, make no mistake, it could lead to lung cancer being diagnosed not just months, but years earlier than it is just now. And delegates, we are the first country in the world to carry out a structured population assessment of this test. It puts Scotland, as we have so often been in the past, in the vanguard of medical progress. It's very early days, but this important innovation really does have the potential to save lives. And I am very proud that Scotland is taking the lead. <clears throat> Friends, exactly three weeks today, we will mark the first anniversary of the abolition of prescription charges in Scotland. That's also a policy I'm very proud of. On the same day, the cost of a prescription in England will rise to £7.65. The tax on ill health there is getting ever higher. Delegates, free prescriptions are just one example of the difference an SNP government makes. And I promise you this, Free prescriptions are here to stay. Our critics, yes, there are one or two, they said we couldn't deliver this policy, uh, but we did. They also said we couldn't afford our pledge on free education, that we wouldn't deliver it, but we can and we did. They said we couldn't deliver a freeze on the council tax, but we did. Delegates, Labour can't be trusted on any of these policies. The message from them is quite clear. And so let us, at every single opportunity, shout it from the rooftops. Vote Labour and household bills will go up. We are we're protecting all of these policies and we are balancing the budget. UK governments, past and present, wouldn't recognise a balanced budget if it hit them on the nose. But under the stewardship of John Swinney, we have worked within the financial constraints placed on us and still delivered on the people's priorities. Priorities based on the principles of enterprise, social justice and fairness. Enterprise, social justice and fairness. Principles that I am very proud to say are the hallmarks of the SNP in government. Now, one of the duties of a compassionate society is to support those who care for others. 
We owe an enormous debt, an enormous debt to more than 650,000 unpaid carers across Scotland. And I want to thank them today for the massive contribution that they make. But words of thanks are not enough. We need to show our support in action. That's why we have already increased respite care by an extra 10,000 weeks every year, and that support will continue. But delegates, I can also announce today that over the next three years, we will give voluntary sector organisations £9 million to provide short breaks for carers. Carers play a vital role in society. We can never, ever repay them, but we must support them in every way that we can, and our government always will. Delegates, we've shown what we can do with limited independence. But if we are to use all of the resources, skills and talents that we have as a nation to build an even better Scotland, then make no mistake, we need real independence. Only independence can stop Westminster government squandering our energy wealth while our older folks struggle to pay their heating bills. Only independence can put a stop to heartless Tory welfare reforms that will punish the vulnerable and the disabled. And only independence, only real independence, will give us the tools that we need to rid Scotland of the poverty and the deprivation that still scars our nation and create the jobs and opportunities that will get people off benefits, but not for Tory reasons, for the right reasons. <laughs> and delegates, only independence will let us set our own priorities. And as a priority, rid this country once and for all of the obscenity of trident nuclear weapons on the River Clyde. <laughs> Friends, independence is the key to unlocking the potential of our country and of our people. But we can start here and now to tackle the big social issues of our day. Alcohol misuse is the biggest public health challenge that we face as a nation. It blights lives, breaks families and wrecks communities. Every single week, our doctors and nurses, our paramedics and police officers deal with the damage done by dirt cheap alcohol. This week, our minimum pricing proposal returns to the Scottish Parliament. Now, last time round, it was backed only by the SNP and the Greens. Uh, but things have changed. The Liberals back it now too. And just last week, even the Scottish Tories decided to give minimum pricing a chance. Now, delegates, this is the first, and it's probably also the last, time you'll ever hear me say something positive about the Tories in a conference speech. But on minimum pricing at least, we should give them credit for doing the right thing. There, <laughs> now there is of course one party, one party that still refuses to budge, preferring abject isolation to common sense. Now, the younger delegates amongst us might struggle to remember this, but there was a day, there was a day when Labour was a progressive party, but not any longer. Now on minimum pricing and on so many issues, Labour is just an obstacle to progress. Deaf to the arguments of health professionals, blind to the damage that cheap alcohol is doing to our communities, Labour is still putting petty political posturing ahead of protecting public health delegates. 
they should be completely and utterly ashamed of themselves. <laughs> Delegates, Labour is a lost cause on this issue, so I don't intend to waste any more breath on them. Let me instead direct my remarks today to voices in this debate that do matter. I know there are some, particularly in the alcohol industry, who still have concerns about this policy. Scotland will be the first country to introduce minimum pricing. So some ask, how can we be sure it will have the effect that we think it will? Now, I have done and I will continue to do my very best to respond to these concerns. Uh, just this week, I agreed that the legislation will have a sunset clause that will allow us to test the policy in practice, but give Parliament a built-in right to review it after five years and then decide its future based on the hard evidence. Minimum pricing will now pass into law with the backing of four out of the five parties represented in our Parliament and with an overwhelming majority. I am confident that it will prevail against any legal challenge that might come its way, but tying it up in the courts will delay the benefits it can bring. So my message today is this, let us all respect the will of Parliament. Let us turn this policy into practice and let us get on with the job of sorting out this nation's relationship with alcohol. Delegates, it's an enormous, an enormous privilege to be Scotland's Health Secretary and I am so very proud of our National Health Service. Thanks to the policies of this government and the dedication of its staff, the Scottish Health Service is delivering care that is faster and safer than ever before. We can never show enough gratitude to those who work in our health service, so let us again today thank all of our NHS staff for everything that they do on our behalf. Of course, of course, I know that the NHS is not perfect. We must always strive to improve it. But let me be very clear. In spite of its imperfections, I believe that our model of healthcare, free at the point of need, publicly funded and publicly delivered, is quite simply the best in the world. And you know, its guiding principles are deeply rooted here in Scotland. By the time the NHS was set up in 1948, half of Scotland was already covered by the first comprehensive state-funded health system anywhere in the UK. The Highlands and Islands Medical Service, as it was called, was set up 35 years before the NHS. And this year, 2012, marks the centenary of the report that led to its establishment. So, delegates, what is in many ways a very British institution is actually very Scottish in its roots. And delegates, hear this. In Scotland, we will stay true to the values of the National Health Service that we helped to create. The Tory Liberal NHS reforms will profoundly change the NHS south of the border. The days of a, a truly public and national health service in England will be at an end. Let me say loudly and clearly, not here, not now, not ever. As long as we are in charge, there will be no privatisation of the NHS in Scotland.
And delegates, the reason I can stand before you and make that promise is that we have the power to make our own decisions on health. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that's a really, really compelling argument for independent decision-making in Scotland, by Scotland, for Scotland. We can and we will protect the NHS from the wrong-headed policies of the UK government. But the English reforms do pose one very real risk to the Scottish NHS. And that risk is a direct result of letting London control Scotland's budget. Just before Christmas, the UK government introduced an amendment to its health bill. That amendment allows hospitals to use up to 49%, 49% of their beds and their theatre time treating private patients. It will create a two-tier system, not between the NHS and the private sector, but within the health service. It's a betrayal of everything the NHS is about. Now, the risk to Scotland is not in policy terms. We will never go down that road. The risk to us is financial. You know, as hospitals in England get more of their money from private patients, I believe that we will see future UK governments freeze or reduce public funding for the NHS. Now, they'll still claim that NHS funding is protected, but the reality will be that less of it will come from the public purse. Delegates, as things stand, that would have a direct effect on Scotland's budget. So my message to you today is this. Devolution allows us to protect the principles of our NHS. But if we want to make absolutely sure that Tory health policies can't damage our health service in any way, then we need independence because only independence can fully guarantee Scotland's National Health Service. Friends, we believe with all of our hearts that our country should be independent. And you know, that doesn't actually make us very special. It just makes us the same as people in the 200 other countries in the world that are already independent. Now, in the coming months, our opponents will hurl every fear and every smear that they can think of at the very idea of Scottish independence. They will tell us that Scotland is too poor, in spite of us being better off than the rest of the UK and actually the sixth richest country in the OECD. They will use nasty, pejorative language all the time knowing that ours is a modern civic nationalism, that we will continue to share a monarchy, a currency, and a strong social union with the other countries in our islands. Delegates, the fact is, the hard, inescapable fact is, that an independent Scotland will be a good friend, a good neighbour, and a responsible member of the international community. We will rise above all of the attacks that come our way. Our cause is a noble one and the case for it is positive. It's based on the simple but very powerful belief that the people best placed to decide how to make Scotland a more successful country are the people who choose to live and work here. Delegates, we are looking forward to the campaign of our lives. The autumn of 2014 is this nation's date with destiny. Uh, yes, there are issues of process to be settled, and they will be. And on the process, I simply say this to the UK government. Let's work together to settle these issues. We can put our political differences aside 
and do the best for Scotland. But remember this, the days of Westminster politicians laying down the law to Scotland are in the past and in the past they will remain. Scotland's referendum will be made and decided here in Scotland. But in the end, our independence will not be determined on issues of process. The how of independence matters, of course it does, but the why matters much, much more. And the answer to the question why is this. Independence is normal. It's the normal state of affairs for individuals and for nations alike. It's not an end in itself, but it is the means by which we make sure this country fulfills its potential. Independence will put our future firmly in our hands. It will give us the opportunity to make different and better decisions in welfare as well as health, the economy as well as education. As an independent nation, we will embrace the interdependence of the modern world. We will continue to be a full and active member of the European Union. We will take a rightful place as a voice for peace and justice in the world. And delegates, we will never ever again be forced to take part in illegal wars. <laughs> delegates, independence will quite simply give us the ability to use all of our vast resources to make Scotland a better country. And that is why I firmly believe that in 2014, the Scottish people will say yes. You know, friends, there's not a single day that passes just now that I, I don't reflect on how incredibly lucky we are lucky to be playing a part at this great moment in our nation's history i often wonder what those colleagues who've gone before us would have given to live through what we are experiencing now we owe it to them and we owe it to scotland to make and to win our case win our case and win our independence Fellow nationalists, that is exactly what we are going to do. When things go wrong, as they sometimes will, and the road you travel, it stays all up here. Let's work together. Come on, come on, let's work together. You know, together we will stand, everybody.